so micrite was not that, you know, fascinating of a limestone. I mean, in, in a way it is, but, you know, that's that. Lots of people, though, like fossiliferous limestone because, well, fossiliferous means filled with fossils. Like this one right here. We can notice that's the fossil of uh, a coral. That's another coral fossil. Uh, that's a shell of a, an organism called a brachiopod. And basically, you just have all kinds of different fossils in a fossiliferous limestone. I don't want you to think, though, that limestones are the only rocks that have fossils in them. You can have a fossiliferous sandstone or a fossiliferous shale. It's just that often um, you get a lot of fossils in limestones, mainly because things like this coral is creating limestone to live in, right? But remember, you can find fossils in any type of sedimentary rock. All right, another type of limestone is called coquina. And coquina forms in places where you have a lot of wave action that's broken apart shells. And you get these little shell fragments that uh, basically get loosely glued together. And oftentimes students tell me that they think that coquina looks sort of like a granola bar or an oatmeal bar because like the little shell fragments look like oats, I guess. And well, you be the judge. That's a coquina. See, all these little pieces are little bits and pieces of shells kind of roughly glued together there. All right, chalk is also a type of limestone. Yes, chalk, the stuff that back in the old days you'd write on the blackboards with. Um, it's also filled with fossils, except they are microscopic fossils. They're these just tiny, tiny little organisms. And they were all floating around in the oceans, and then eventually the little organisms would die, and they would sink to the bottom of the ocean, but their little calcite shell would accumulate and make, um, make the chalk. Um, this is what chalk looks like. Um, let's see, uh, if you've ever gone to southern England, the White Cliffs of Dover, or you could go to northern France or northern Germany, you see these um, large white cliffs, like what we have there in Rügen. And those are entirely made from chalk. So lots, billions of tiny little um, shells of ancient organisms make up those cliffs. A uh, type of limestone I really like is called oolitic limestone. And oolitic limestone is made from these little spheres of uh, calcite called ooids. And uh, I, I just happen to like this, not just because it has a weird name like oolitic. It looks kind of cool. Right? There's all our tiny little ooids in there, those little spheres. Well, this oolitic limestone forms in a very specific environment. It forms in warm, shallow ocean water. So warm, shallow water. First of all, it's uh, warm, and that means we're getting some evaporation, and the um, limestone, the, the dissolved calcite, is getting concentrated, so it starts precipitating out of the water. But the water is also shallow, so we have wave action, this kind of back and forth movement. So what then happens is little tiny like sand fragments or shell fragments are kind of rolling back and forth on the bottom of this shallow ocean because of the waves. And as they sort of roll around on the bottom, calcite um, coats them. So we get these nice spheres of calcite. So anytime you see an oolitic limestone, you know you're dealing with a place where there was a warm, shallow ocean. In fact, I found oolitic limestone off in the middle of the desert in Utah. Now granted, it's ancient limestone, it comes from the days of the dinosaurs, uh, but that tells me that way back in the days of the dinosaurs, there was a warm, shallow body of water off in what today is the desert of Utah. All right, last but not least in our limestones, we have something called travertine. This forms in caves and hot springs. 
This is what travertine looks like. Um, it's typically kind of a white or pale gray color, but depending on some impurities, you can get some other colors in there. Now, how does travertine form? Well, let's use this example at a hot spring. The hot spring's actually over here and that water came out and it was nice and hot and it would flow over this area and as water cools down it loses its ability to hold minerals in solution. Hot water holds a whole lot more stuff in solution than cold water. So as that hot water flowed away from the hot spring and cooled off, it would start to precipitate calcite. And this entire giant thing we see here, that's all calcite that was precipitated by this water that was uh, flowing from the hot spring and cooling off. So those are the different types of limestone that you might see. And limestone is the most abundant chemical sedimentary rock, but there are other chemical sedimentary rocks. We have dolostone, which is composed of dolomite, which is also a carbonate, but it has some magnesium in it. And it's not completely understood how they form. I mean, you want to make a name in geology, like really uh, figure out exactly how limestone or dolostones form. It's thought that they tend to form in arid coastal areas where you have some brine, um, basically really, really salty water flowing through the limestone, which alters it into dolostone. Um, another chemical sedimentary rock that you've actually already seen because you saw it in the mineral lab is something called chert. Chert is microcrystalline quartz. So basically, if you would look at it under the microscope, you'd see all kinds of tiny little crystals of quartz in there. And uh, these are bits of chert. And this can be chemical. It can directly precipitate from water. Uh, this happens more often in uh, like volcanic areas. But it can also be biochemical. It can be created by organisms. There are some organisms that live in the world's oceans that secrete um, silica. Silica is quartz uh, shells. And just like that chalk would pile up, right? The, the little organisms would die and their shells would sink to the bottom of the ocean. Same thing can happen with the silica producing organisms. Then another place where we get um, uh, chert from is sponges. Sponges are a very primitive organism. They're an animal that is um, it's very squishy, but the thing that gives some sponges a little bit of support for their body are these things called spicules. And spicules are tiny little like needles of, uh, of uh, silica, of quartz. So eventually when the sponge dies, its body decays away, but it leaves these little quartz spicules behind that can basically crystallize into these little blobs of chert that we have. Uh, chert is often associated with limestones because the limestone forms in your, uh, your nice uh, warm oceans. Well, where are your sponges and things like that living in your nice warm oceans? So often you'll see limestones like this, the light gray is the limestone, and you will often see these little pods, these uh, uh, blobs of chert in there. Um, Native Americans and, and other uh, people used to actually take this chert and use it to shape arrowheads and spear points and other tools. All right, other chemical sedimentary rocks that we can have. You can have evaporites. And, um, well, evaporites, if we just look at the name, that should tell you how they form. They form from the evaporation of water. And where do we get a lot of evaporation? In hot, dry areas. Uh, because if the air is very dry, it can take a lot of water into it. And so these are going to be common in deserts. And what we're looking at here in this uh, photograph, this is Death Valley back in like uh, 2005. They had a really, really wet winter. And so what happened uh, was all the snow melted out of the mountains and uh, filled Death Valley with water. That's what's behind me in the photograph. In fact, there's something like 12 feet of water out there and there's some dude kayaking in there when, uh, when we went by. 
And um, this water was very, very salty though. So as that water evaporated away, it left all of this white stuff there, which is salt behind. Because when water evaporates, um, it's just the water that evaporates. Anything dissolved in the water gets left behind. So what are some of our evaporites? Rock salt is one of the most common, right? That's the mineral halite. Uh, so how do you identify rock salt? Lick it. If you lick it and it tastes salty, well, you're dealing with halite. Um, there's some halite actually forming, and this was uh, in Death Valley. We took some of the salty water and poured it on the ground and watched the water evaporate and watched these, these crystals of halite forming in there. You can also get rock gypsum forming. Again, the mineral gypsum, calcium sulfate. As water evaporates, it can get left behind. And this is what uh, typical gypsum ends up looking like. And remember to identify gypsum, you can scratch it with your fingernail. A special type of chemical sedimentary rock is something called a banded iron formation. These do not form on Earth anymore. They only formed in a time period called the Precambrian because this very early Earth, and the Precambrian is the earliest time period in Earth's history, early Earth was very different from today. In fact, there was no oxygen, no O2 in the atmosphere at that time. When there was no oxygen in the atmosphere, iron could dissolve in the world's oceans. But in the middle of the Precambrian, um, photosynthesis began. And the byproduct of photosynthesis is oxygen. The thing about iron is it loves to bond with oxygen. But when it bonds with oxygen, it becomes insoluble. So in the Precambrian, as this oxygen is being added to the atmosphere, it's bonding with the iron in the world's oceans, becoming insoluble, precipitating, and creating these very, very pretty banded iron formations. We will talk more about those later in the semester, and that's because this is where a lot of our iron resources today um, are, are mined. And uh, so... Um, I happen to really like these. They look pretty. All right, last of our sedimentary rock types are the organic sedimentary rocks. And like I said earlier, these are going to be coal, the remains of land plants. So basically what happens in places like uh, swampy areas um, Organic material, your, your leaves and your trees and stuff like that, falls into the swampy water. And this swampy water is low in oxygen. And when there's not a lot of oxygen, you don't get a whole lot of decay. And so this organic material can start building up, accumulating, and ultimately getting turned into coal. So coal typically forms in swamps and bogs where you have limited decomposition. There are a few types of coal uh, that are considered sedimentary rocks. You have peat, lignite, and bituminous coal. And what does coal look like? It's black and uh, you can burn it. Uh, and check this one out. This is an actual tree trunk that got turned into coal, which uh, shows you it's organic material that uh, did not decay. Okay, so one thing that I love about studying sedimentary rocks is they tell us so much about Earth's history. And I really, um, one of the things I like about being a geologist is you can go all over the world and you can look at the landscape and you can look at the rocks and you can kind of look into Earth's epic history. And one of the ways you can do that is by studying the sedimentary rocks. And uh, sedimentary rocks are great for this because different sedimentary rocks form in different depositional environments. And this is the geographic setting where sediment is accumulating, right? Sediment doesn't accumulate everywhere. It accumulates in very specific places. And each environment is characterized by a certain set of geological processes 
and environmental conditions, right? The conditions in a desert are going to be very different from the conditions in a tropical rainforest, which are going to be very different from the conditions in the Arctic. And so you get different rocks forming in these different places. So some of the typical depositional environments for sedimentary rocks, here are some of the ones on the continents, right, on land. Fluvial refers to rivers. So if you hear geologists saying something like, look at the fluvial sedimentary rock, they mean look at a sedimentary rock that formed in a river. Right? So rivers, glacial areas, glaciers are big masses of ice. Aeolian refers to wind deposited sediments. Aeolus was the Roman god of the winds, so Aeolian sediments are ones deposited by wind. And lacustrine refers to lakes. Now you can also have sediments forming in transitional environments, places like deltas. So a transitional environment is basically where the continent, where land meets the ocean. And a delta is where a river, right, fluvial, something on land, is flowing into the ocean. So that's a transitional environment, a delta, where this river flows into the sea. A beach. Right, where the ocean is washing back and forth on land. Or a tidal flat. A tidal flat is an area that's underwater at high tide but above water at low tide. And then we have our marine depositional environments. Marine refers to the world's oceans. Shallow marine is anything less than 200 meters deep and deep marine is anything greater than that. What I have here, this is just a, a nice diagram showing some of these different depositional environments and the sedimentary rocks that accumulate or are formed in each of these. And no, I'm not going to make you memorize this, but it does give you a good idea of just how variable the places where sedimentary rocks form are. So for example, we have like the beach, you tend to have sandstone at. Um, you tend to have uh, limestone, right, carbonates, limestone's a carbonate, in reefs. Uh, in a desert lake where you have a lot of evaporation, you get rock salt and gypsum. And so this is just something to give you an idea of the different places where different sedimentary rocks form. And we're going to skip that because I don't feel like talking about that today. All right. so. One thing about uh, being a geologist, I often say geology is like um, CSI, planet Earth, right? Where we're gathering uh, clues and we're gathering data from different rocks to put together this history of the Earth and, and show us what forces have shaped the Earth, uh, which then also gives us an understanding of what sorts of things do we have to live with on the planet. And so let's look at some of these special details in sedimentary rocks that we look at and what they can tell us about how and where that rock formed. And one of the things we'll look at, we'll look at the grain size. Remember in the clastic rocks you could have like gravel sized or sand sized or so on. Um, well, the grain size can tell us the energy conditions of transport. It's going to take a whole lot more energy to move big rocks than to move really small ones. Uh, so if you have um, sediment that was moved by wind, wind cannot move giant house sized boulders. So if you have something where there's these giant boulders in it, you should not be thinking, aha, wind did this. You have to look for something that's stronger, right? So wind will typically move small particles, things like, like ice, glaciers move really big particles. Now, in addition to grain size, another detail we tend to look at is something called sorting. And sorting is the degree of similarity of particle size. So we can have something like very poorly sorted, right, where we have big, small, medium, everything, all the way down to very well sorted, where pretty much every particle in that sedimentary rock is just about the same size. And again, this can tell us a little bit about what transported that sediment. I'm going to go back to glaciers and wind. Glacial ice 
can move everything from house-sized boulders to the tiniest little particle of clay. On the other hand, wind can only transport certain particle sizes. So sedimentary rocks created by glaciers tend to be more poorly sorted. Sedimentary rocks created by wind tend to be more well sorted. Now, last of these sedimentary textures that we're looking at is the grain shape. And uh, you can have everything from angular with these really sharp edges all the way to something that's rounded. And this, again, can indicate a little bit about how it was transported, but especially it can indicate how far it was transported. Right? If something's kind of rolling and bouncing in, um, in say, a river, it's going to start wearing off those sharp edges. So the farther it gets carried, the rounder your sediment will tend to become.